Okay, so here I am and unmuted. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, I will be. It will be my pleasure to speak to you about twenty minutes, twenty minutes, twenty-five minutes about imperial love, indeed, marriage and uh, succession. And I have, of course, chosen for the marvelous purple, which was on the poster of this small colloquium, and which is also, by the way, our University of Manchester uh, purple. So here we go. I'd like to start my story with what happened on the 19th of August of the year 14, and maybe some days after this 19th of August. Uh, this is, in fact, a sad story of a man who also spent his last years in sadness. This is the story of Emperor Augustus, who died in on the 19th of August of the year 14. And he was buried, of course, in this monument which he had built for himself, the so-called Mausoleum of Augustus. Now, the real sad thing about this story and about his old age that uh, is that all these people who were meant to be in this mausoleum after him, so his close family members, well, that at least some of them and the most important of them were actually in the grave, in the mausoleum before him. This really made uh, Augustus' old age a sad time and a sad period. And I think you might agree with me that the monument looks a bit sad also. It's really like a ruin in Rome, or should I say it was like a ruin because that's how it looks. This is how it looks like now. And it appears to be uh, restored just uh, some months ago and it reopened for visit on the 1st of March of this year. So whenever it is again possible to go to uh, Rome, I would say that it's very much worth paying a visit to. This is the Mausoleum of Augustus as it looks, uh, as it looks like nowadays. Okay, dear audience, suppose that I was going to tell you, well, I will actually explain you about Augustus's family and about his successor and about his succession. And if I were to use this slide, this genealogical tree, I guess you would all just close your eyes or do something different and just say, well, let this just pass because of course this looks like awfully difficult. I will try to somehow simplify things for you, but also point to the most important things of the story of dynasties and succession. Right, here we go. The most important women in Augustus's life, Augustus, who, as you can see, was born in the year six, uh, 63 uh, BCE. Well, I guess we can say that his mother has always been very, very important. Here she is depicted. She's called Atia or Akia on this coin. And she lived till he was 20 years of age. And Suetonius will say that Augustus lost his mother during his first consulship, that is in the year 43 BCE. Another key figure in his youth and, of course, in his later life too, was his sister Octavia. And he would lose her in his 54th year, that is the, in the year 9 BCE. And in his biography, so the biography of Augustus, which, is, uh, which was written uh, in the late 1st century CAE by Suetonius, it is said that to both he showed marked devotion during their lifetime, and he also paid him the highest honors after their death. So mother Atia on the left and sister Octavia on the right. Now, what about these other women? What about Augustus's? wives. Well, quite remarkable. His biography tells us that he was betrothed to the daughter of a certain Publius Servilius Isauricus, uh, but that when he became uh, reconciled with Antony after their first quarrel and the troops begged that the rivals be further united by some type of kinship, that he took as a wife 
Anthony's stepdaughter, Claudia. So she was his first wife. We think that she was only aged about 13 or 14 years of age, not more. She was barely of marriageable age. But because of Augustus' falling out with his mother-in-law, Fulvia, he divorced her before they had begun to live together. So you could hardly call this first marriage a marriage. Augustus, then still called Octavius, of course, shortly after married for the second time. This was to Scribonia. At that time, when he was 23 years of age, she was about 25 years of age. And she had been wedded twice already before. And she was a mother by one of her, uh, um, a mother by one of her ex-husbands already. But she, apparently, as you can read, was not a very nice character. He was unable to put up with a shrewish disposition, Suetonius says. And uh, then, eventually, he took as his third wife, Livia, Livia Drusilla. And this is interesting, again, because Livia Drusilla already had two children by her first husband. One was born already, the name was Tiberius. The other one will be called Drusus, and Livia was still pregnant when she divorced her husband and when she decided to live with Octavius and to marry him too. So this is quite a remarkable story, but this seems to have be, been a very happy marriage, Suetonius says, and he loved Livia and esteemed her to the end without a rival. At the moment of this marriage, Livia is, as a mother of two children, or almost two children, 25, uh, 21 years of age. Octavius is 25 years of age. Okay. Now remember, Octavius was first uh, married, or for the second time married, to Scribonia. Well, we read that by Scribonia, he had a daughter. This is the one you can see here. She's called Julia or Julia the Elder. By Livia, he had no children at all, although he earnestly desired issue. One baby was conceived, but was prematurely born and died almost instantaneously, as it unfortunately quite often happened in antiquity. So this happy marriage between Livy and Octavius never had any children of its own. What do you do when you are a king or an emperor and you only have one daughter? Of course, you go searching for a good son-in-law. This is what Augustus did. Again, according to Suetonius, he gave Julia in marriage first to Marcellus. Interesting, Marcellus, son of his sister Octavia, and hardly more than a boy. So Julia, Julia the Elder, marries her cousin, being Marcellus. This happens in the year 25 BCE. At that time, Julia was only 14 years of age. Marcellus, hardly more than a boy, was 17 years of age. On the left, you see young Marcellus, and we only have images of this young Marcellus because the poor boy already died two years later. When you go to Rome, to see the mausoleum of Augustus, just go also to right to the center where you will see the theater of Marcellus. This is a theater that was built in honor of Marcellus after his death, his premature death, as I told you, in the year 23 BCE. Okay. So, of course, Augustus needed another son in law, another husband to his daughter, Julia. Now, what was his second choice? Let's listen again to Suetonius. He says, and then 
After Marcellus's death, he married Julia, Julia to Marcus Agrippa, prevailing upon his sister to yield her son-in-law to him. For at that time, Agrippa was married to one of the Marcellas and had children from her. From her. So interesting, there were two Marcella daughters, daughters of Octavia, and so one of these Marcellas was married to Agrippa. Uh, they had to divorce, and Agrippa had to marry Julia the Elder. We are speaking now about the year 21 BCE. We know that at that time, Julia was 18 years of age, while Agrippa was approximately 43 years old. So double of his wife. Again, please look at the pictures. On the left, you have the somewhat severe image of uh, Agrippa, surely already a man in his 40s. And at the right, you see another of these beautiful, magnificent monuments of Rome. This is, of course, the Pantheon, right in the center again, where you can read together with me this Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, Lucifidius, and well, he actually made this building a building, fake it, consul tertium. So when he was uh, a consul for the third time in his life. Right. Julia is now married to Agrippa. And this turns out to be a very fertile marriage. There were, in fact, five children, three sons named Gaius, Lucius, and Agrippa, and two daughters, which makes two granddaughters, of course, for Augustus, Julia, she's also called Julia the Younger, and Agrippina. And as you can see in this beautiful fragment, which I'm not going to read aloud now, um, uh, Augustus, as an emperor, was, of course, very fond of his grandsons. He actually adopted the first two of them, Gaius and Lucius, and he gave them a sort of uh, private education of his own. The same also for the granddaughters who were uh, actually raised and educated as true Roman matronae. So they really had to be like what in uh, Augustus' time was considered as virtuous Roman women. And you can see all sorts of details here about their education, both of the grandsons and the granddaughters, as it is described by Suetonius. I like very much the very last sentence. He taught his grandsons reading, swimming, so also physical education, because they have to become good emperors, and the other elements of education for the most part he taught it himself taking special pains to train him to imitate his own handwriting and he never dined in their company unless they sat beside him on the lowest couch or made a journey unless they preceded his carriage or rode close by it on either side so these two young men Gaius and Lucius were of course supposed to become his successors and they were like his own sons sons he never had so, you would think that with one daughter, Julia, or Julia the Elder, one son-in-law, a man of status, Agrippa, three grandsons, Gaius, Lucius, and Agrippa Postumus, and two granddaughters, Julia and Agrippa, um, succession would be fairly safe. But this almost sounds like a greek tragedy suetonius says and i quote from the 65th chapter of the life of augustus but at the height of his happiness and his confidence in his family and its training fortune proved fickle what happened here we go suspense suspense First of all, his son-in-law, Agrippa, died in the year 12 BCE, before his son, Agrippa Postumus, was born. So Julia was still pregnant with child when the father died. And that's actually why that third son of the marriage, Agrippa, was called Agrippa Postumus, because Postumus means 
basically born when your father uh, was already not there anymore, when your father was already dead. Julia herself was kind of forced to marry for the third time. She would marry Tiberius. Tiberius, who was, as you may remember from the other slide, who was actually one of the two sons of Livia. And this never was a happy marriage. In fact, we read about the marriage being very unhappy. And she uh, begins to demonstrate all sorts of bad behavior. That is at least behavior you wouldn't expect from a Roman matrona. Uh, so she, Julia, was exiled in the year 2 BCE officially for reasons of adultery and treason. She will live on in exile, an island south of Italy, and she will die in the year 14, some months later than her father, Augustus. Now, there were daughters, as you may remember. There was Julia. She's the um, eldest daughter. She's called Julia the Younger. Well, she sort of experiences the same fate as her mom. Somewhat later, in the year 8 CE, she is exiled for conspiracy also. And she will also die in exile after a sad continuation of her life for almost 20 years. But of course, there were grandsons, sons of Agrippa and Julia. What happened to them? Well, first, the daughter, Agrippina, Agrippina the Elder. Well, she will marry Germanicus, and that would be the subject, of course, of another talk, because they had six children, uh, among whom one um, future emperor, and so on and so on. But basically, important to know that she marries and that she has kind of a good life. But what about these sons? Well, first of all, Gaius. Gaius, who was the oldest grandson, and he was supposed to become Augustus' successor, well, he will go to what would nowadays be Turkey, and uh, he will die of an illness in Lycia in the year 4. He was only, at the moment of his death, 23 years of age. And this was particularly sad, because his younger brother, Lucius had already died two years before. In fact, Lucius had died again from an illness, we don't know about the details, in present day south of France near Massilia. He was only 18 years of age. Now, there still was that other boy Remember, the boy who was born when or before uh, when Agrippa, the father himself, already had died. Of course, he would be left as the ideal candidate to be Augustus's successor. But apparently there was a problem here. Suetonius again says about Augustus, he soon disowned Agrippa because of his low tastes and violent temper and sent him off to Surrentum. Surrentum is actually, again, rather south of Italy, present-day Sorrento. What was going on here? Well, to be honest, we don't really know. One of the things I like to study is what is called um, disability history. Uh, of antiquity, and some scholars have made a suggestion that there was perhaps a sort of mental problem with Agrippa Postumus. I can only say that we cannot ever know this for sure. Yeah? The Latin text, uh, text literally says, op ingenium sordidum ac ferox, and this is really something like a foul character and a violent character. Nothing more. So, of course, Suetonius doesn't write as a psychologist. He will just give like this moral connotation about Agrippa Postumus. There must have been a problem, absolutely. So we know that um, uh, Augustus had adopted uh, him too. But then 
Suddenly, he didn't want to know about the boy anymore, maybe because of his character, but was this also because of a so-called disability? We just cannot know for sure. Okay. So, when also Agrippa Postumus was not a right candidate, the only one who was left was this man. This is Tiberius. Tiberius, remember, he was forced into that marriage with Julia the Elder, which means that he was Augustus' son-in-law. He was also, remember, Augustus' stepson, because he was a child from a former marriage of uh, Livia. Now, Suetonius, in quite some cruel detail, writes how also he, Tiberius, was really forced into that marriage with Julia the Elder. There is that sad detail where it is said that Tiberius, Tiberius once uh, met his former wife on the street. Uh, he had a son with her, and this was actually a very a happy marriage. And so he, as a Roman man, as a Roman aristocrat, cried in public when he met his former wife. Another not very pleasant aspect for him, for Tiberius, was that he was utterly uh, disliked by, I apologize for the typo, disliked, of course, by Augustus. But he was the only one left, which means that on the 19th of August of the year 14, when Augustus, when Augustus dies after his long reign, he inherits two-thirds of Augustus's incredible wealth, while his mother, Livia, who was so happy, of course, that her son would become the successor, while his mother, Livia, would also add to her incredible wealth by inheriting one third of Augustus's wealth. Pliny the Elder, who is an author about whom my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Mary Began, she will just speak today also to you, I guess, is much more knowledgeable than me. Well, Pliny the Elder will say that Tiberius was actually the, I quote in Latin now, the tristissimus hominum, the saddest of all human beings. Also, as an emperor, you may perhaps imagine why, after what I've explained to you. And what was, according to Tacitus, one of the first deeds of the new regime of Tiberius? Well, this was actually getting rid of that one grandson of Augustus who was still there. It seems that in the last days of Augustus's reign, there was perhaps going to be sort of reconciliation between grandson and uh, grandfather. So just for Tiberius, in order to be sure that he didn't have that rival anymore, he murdered, he eliminated Agrippa Postumus. I should have started by thanking Andy and Nikki for the invitation, because in a way, this invitation and preparing this uh, presentation also sort of forced me to go through the sources again. Um, and by doing so, I just experienced that enormous joy one can have in uh, reading and rereading these ancient sources. And this has been done for centuries. And in a way, the story I told you now makes, of course, also for good fiction. And if you ever want to read about this, this is uh, a novel. Uh, by an American author, uh, which I love so much. It's just called Augustus, called uh, John Williams. And this is fiction that really comes close to what is called faction. So it's, it's, it's very well documented. And at the same time, it takes that empathical approach. It wants to, uh, well, tell us more about what we can presume about these various characters at the court of Augustus and how they live their lives, how their emotions must have been and so on, and so on. So reading and rereading of these ancient sources is always such fun to do. Sorry. 
At the same time, I wanted to show you something which uh, relates to what in scholarship is called the life course approach. Uh, this is very much a fashionable uh, topic to study nowadays. Um, so we really look at uh, at what age a certain person did what and how this events sort of relate with what you would expect from somebody of that age or perhaps not at all would be unusual for a person of that age in his or her society. This is an approach with very which very much forces you as an historian also to go for this empathical approach. And if you ever want to read a nice booklet which takes this approach, I would very much recommend you reading uh, Mary Harlow and Ray Lawrence. The book is called Growing Up and Growing Old in Ancient Rome. I think you would all agree with me that this story is very much revealing also about family strategies in the ancient world. Strategies that relate to love, marriage, and perhaps for this family, the most important aspect, also the succession. Because officially, the Republic was still existing. But Augustus, of course, realized that his new regime, his new construction, could only live on if he could really continue this dynasty, continue this succession. So before he died, he really needed to be sure about a successor. And it was perhaps not the man he had dreamed of, but eventually he found his solution with Tiberius. Now, this life course approach and this emphasis also on families is a thing and an emphasis and a study also you will surely find at our department, our wonderful department of classics, ancient history, archaeology and Egyptology at the University of Manchester. So to all of you who are in the last grade, I would say consider this and it would be my pleasure to welcome you next year, this is this year, next academic year at the University of Manchester. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I find it deeply fascinating, this idea of studying, as you say, the, the life course approach. Um, it's sometimes difficult with Egyptian sources, especially the older ones, because they very rarely make explicit reference to the age of different people. Uh, especially kings, you get the feeling that they arrive fully formed as grown people, uh, which of course cannot have been the case. So um, we have a couple of minutes before the pause, so or before the break. So uh, if anyone has any questions for for, for Christian, can you please uh, type them uh, type them in the chat? I don't know, Andy. Do you have any uh, any specific questions? Um, I don't know. I can. I think I can't see you at the moment. Ah, there you are. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm certainly here, um, Nikki. Um, I don't. Perhaps Christian should perhaps stop sharing his screen. I don't know to, okay. to let people. Um, um, oh yes, that would be good actually, because I, I need to put up a, a, a screen for the for the break. So that would hold be on great. a second. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, that's no. It, it, this is. Uh, I, I think Christian brought home um, the problems here with that very terrifying family tree that um, often appears in textbooks and, and and scares people rotten. I remember certainly, um, I was being scared rotten at, at that point. Um, perhaps we should go to the questions that are, are there from people who participated, though, because I see they're coming in now. So uh, um, yes, we have a couple let me here. shut up, and I'll, I'll talk later. Right, let's see. Uh, could Livia have possibly been responsible for any of these deaths as I, Claudius, yeah. depicts? Uh, my answer would be very brief. Possibly. That's a thing we never know, of course, but, but it's often in these stories about uh, succession and about deaths intervening that, that there is the sort of suspicion that, well, somebody uh, could have profited, of course, from this death, and so that somebody could somehow be responsible for it. Uh, this is the great thing about 
about just reading this and rereading this so you can sort of imagine all sorts of scenarios at the same time keeping in mind that that uh, we can never ever uh, know for sure but of course what Robert Graves do, uh, does in his uh, uh, I Claudius novels is just great also as a sort of hypothesis of, of, of what have what might have going on and uh, well it's it's uh, it's, uh, I'd say, a novel and also a telenovela that I would always recommend you to watch. Also, for those of you who are only 17 or 18 years of age, uh, I know. So when you watch the um, the telenovela, I Claudius, it it it, uh, it looks like slow. It doesn't have the same rhythm and pace as we are used to now when we watch television or movies. But it's very much worth uh, having a look at. Absolutely. I think we have one uh, other question here. What is your favorite imperial relationship uh, with the emperors like Augustus and Livia or Caligula? <laughs> well, well, well uh, I'd say um, I'm very much interested in these uh, little stories which uh, tell something about uh, daily life. And um, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes concerning uh, emperors and family relations is actually about uh, Vespasian who as an uh, old man uh, still remembers the birthday of his grandmother uh, with whom he was uh, raised and educated. And so here you get a glimpse of these uh, family relations which really involved love also, uh, which could continue even after the death of uh, of a person. And of course, this all happened when, when when Vespasian wasn't even meant to become an emperor. That's for sure. But but when he was an emperor and, and an older man already, he still uh, commemorates his his uh, grandmother. And I'm actually supervising a PhD now, which is just on grandparents and grandchildren. Uh, in Roman antiquity, and I always find it fascinating to to read uh, such details with the authors. <laughs>